Geraldine Jameson on Manx Radio. Hello and a very warm welcome to this week's programme. Now, I'm delighted to welcome a real live soap star as my guest today. After a five-year stint in the army, he began his acting career working in repertory and minor TV series before landing a role in Coronation Street, appearing in the very first episode. Viewers have watched him grow up as Ken Barlow, a university graduate, young rebel, teacher, community development officer, newspaper man, supermarket trolley man, and currently we see him back in the classroom. Well, on screen, he has been married three times and widowed twice, fathered three children, I think, and is the only original cast member still in this serial drama. Well, welcome indeed, William Roach, MBE, to Manx Radio and to the Geraldine Jameson interview. Thank you very much. Lovely to be with you, Geraldine. Now, I've caught up with you, William, um, earlier this week. Actually, yeah. you were over here on a very brief visit, less than 24 hours to our Isle of Man. So what was the purpose? What brought you over to our island? Well, I came over. I was invited uh, by uh, Ken Riding of the Christian Spiritualist Church to come over and uh, give a little talk, which I did, and met everybody at the church, and we had a... I had a very enjoyable evening anyway. It's not a part of you, actually, that is sort of um, familiar, really, I'm sure, with all your uh, soap. I know you don't care for the word too much, but that's what's been uh, changed from serial drama to soap opera now. Um, but it's not something we, we associate with you, really, or do you keep this deliberately quiet? I No, I, I don't go out. Uh, the tabloids tend to want sensational things and they tend to trivialise things. And uh, when I'm doing these talks, they're about... Well, what I regard uh, life is all about and serious matters, and I, I'm very happy to talk about them to people who are genuinely interested and want to know, but the tabloids generally want some sound bite and quick things. So I don't um, deliberately hide it, but neither do I go out and talk about it. Yeah. And the press don't tend to pick up too much on this side of things which I'm quite pleased about, really. Uh, we can just go out and enjoy ourselves. Well, I'm sure, Ethan, this may surprise our, our audience today, that even your co-cast members are maybe not aware of this side of you as well. Well, uh, they may be slightly aware of it, but we tend to, although we work very closely professionally, we don't meet up socially at all. Uh, and why should we? You know, a lot of businesses like that, you, you, and particularly we work emotionally and, and in many cases intimately uh, with people. So you're only too happy to go your own way, and we all have our own private lives, and most of them are very preoccupied with what they do. And the sort of thing that I'm interested in, esoteric philosophy and the meaning of life, is quite profound. So though people don't, they possibly know, and just occasionally someone will come up and ask me about it. And I'm very pleased when that happens, and I'm happy to talk about it. But other than that, I don't know. Well, let's just skim the surface a little, yeah. if we may. Um, you were always searching for, for the meaning of life. Mm. Um, death scared you. Yeah. No one can cope with infinity. That yeah. is an, that's yeah. impossible. You obviously listened to the talk last night. Well done, Gerald. <laughs> very good. Yeah. But what, what I think, of course, affected us all there is the death of a very small child. Yes. And you lost a daughter of yours at mm. just uh, 18 months. 18 months, yeah. And facing the funeral four mm. days after that death. Mm. Because it was a cot death, was it? Um, it wasn't actually a cot death. No, it was some sort of acute um, bronchial, not actually actually pneumonia but doctors said they've seen children die actually in front of them but their little tubes get totally sort of blocked out and it was awful it just happened very quickly from what was a bad cold to literally went up saw her in a bed made her comfortable half an hour later she'd gone and it is the most devastating thing when a child it's awful when any close relative dies but as I said last night, with a child, there's an added feeling because you're a parent of guilt that somehow you've let them down. And it was the most awful. Uh, grief was a physical pain. You don't, you don't expect to outlive your children. No, you way. don't. A absolutely right. And, and at a tender age like that of 18 months, personality was just coming through and everything. Uh, little Edwina, we, you're getting to know them. And, and suddenly, gone. You, you just can't believe it. And uh, so my wife and I went through incredible grief. I didn't realize grief could be physically painful like that, but it, it was. And um, I, I tried to talk to people. I picked the phone up. I just burst into tears. I, I couldn't go out, speak to anybody. And then the thought of facing the funeral was I didn't think we'd be able to do it. I was going to carry the coffin myself. 
Um, but on the morning of the funeral, I woke up and I saw this, I, can only, I call it a glory, like a golden uh, circle. And Edwina's little smiling face is in the middle of it. And I know it wasn't a dream. I actually saw that. And with it came a wonderful feeling of peace. I'm not saying all the grief went, but it lifted to make everything bearable. And from then on, we tried to enjoy uh, the moments that we had with her. I mean, I know she'd gone on. I know where she is. Uh, this is the temporary place. Uh, the spiritual realms are our permanent home, and she's there. But just that vision of her, though, reassured yeah. you that she was all right, and in, in probably trying to reassure you. Oh, oh there's no doubt. That was for, that was for my benefit. And, and she, as a child, wouldn't have been able to do that. That was an angelic thing. There, there would be great beings, I believe, in angels, and they would have uh, manifested this mm -hmm. uh, to help me. And my wife, she said at the same time, though she didn't see this, she felt this lifting this feeling of, of, of peace or, or less grief. Definitely done for my benefit, uh, but an act of love. And, and uh, to, to get a manifestation like that done, as I understand it from, from the other realms, uh, needs a great being, uh, an angel or something like that, to help assist in that. And there was that feeling, a wonderful feeling of happiness. Do you think, um, do you believe in destiny? Do you think our paths are, are laid out here? The, uh, up to a point. Um, we come in with a destiny, things to fulfill, and a way of life. But it's up to us how we respond. That is our main thing, our reaction. And uh, if we can learn forgiveness and to love and serve and forget ourselves, then everything is much easier to cope with. Uh, we That's like striving for perfection. Though. Oh, well, we are striving for perfection. And yes, it's a long way off, and none of us are. I mean, I can talk about these things. I'm far from achieving them. But uh, the, then these are how I understand them. And we must strive. Yeah, this is what we're here for to learn and we are imperfect beings otherwise we wouldn't be here but our permanent home and our main home is on the spiritual realms and we come here to develop and learn and, and enjoy it if we can. <laughs> well you certainly held a considerable audience I must say at Ken Riding's Christian Spiritualist Church in Dukes Road and Douglas last night it was terrific and very enjoyable oh, well, marvelous performance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether you felt that your destiny was to become this long-standing actor, you know, in, in Coronation Street. But let me just set the scene regards that for, for our audience. Um, Ken Barlow, as I've said at the top of the program, was in the very first episode of Coronation Street. And that was broadcast live from Granada Studios on ITV on the 9th of December, 1960. I presume that's etched in your mind, Absolutely. William. Well done. You've really done your homework, Geraldine. Absolutely. It is etched in my mind because it was the first episode, which we'd done as a pilot before, so I, I knew it quite well. But uh, the fact it's live, live television, is, is really frightening. But in those days, quite a lot was live, and it was more commonplace. Even some of the commercials used to cut to a studio and do them live. They were really <laughs> crude and unbelievable. So um, live in those days wasn't so bad, but I presume you're going to get on to the live one that we did uh, well, yes. two years ago. Oh, <laughs> that boy. was 40 years later, of course, oh. for the 40th anniversary. And everyone kept saying, well, it's all right for you. You've done it before. I thought, yeah, that was 40 years ago, and things are very different. And, and this, this was a special hour long. It was a, an hour long and always on live programs. If you've got some outside scenes, you pre-shoot those because you don't know what the weather's going to be. But we didn't even do that because the studio opened straight onto the street. And we actually filmed the exterior shots. It could have been raining, galing, anything, as well as the interior. And um, it, it, we knew that about 20 million people were going to be watching, uh, 18 million of whom would be sadists looking for the, the mistake. Uh, fortunately, it went smoothly, but it, it absolutely terrifying. But you were completely at the centre, very much at the centre mm. of the storyline for that, which involved the tarmacking of the oh, streets. Oh, yes, taking the old cobbles up. How dare they even <laughs> think of it? Yes, so yeah. how did it feel, actually, when, when, you know, when you were doing it? Well... When you're in the theatre, you get very nervous before anyone, and it, all actors get nervous and quite petrified, but usually once the play starts, you get into it and that's fine. With this, uh, you had, I was on the first scene, which was out on the street, and you stand there waiting, and you hear the countdown, and then you hear the theme tune, and it, oh, the adrenaline's pumping, and then the, the floor manager's standing there with his hand raised, and when he drops his hand, you start. So you're getting all nervous, he drops his hand, and you do your first little bit, and you think, oh, thank goodness. And then you quietly walk, 
and doors are held open and there's silence backstage to your next set, which was inside where I had to sit down. And again, I had to wait. And I went through the whole thing again. Nerve, floor manager with his hand up, his hand drops. You do your little bit. And then I had to walk into the Rovers. The next scene, went through it all. Every scene for an hour was like that. And I knew at the very end, I got this big speech about a toast to the street and everything. And I just prayed that I could get it out. So one of the um, executives just before, they were backstage. They shouldn't have been there, really. Um, and about 7.50, because they put their neck on the line doing this live show. That nobody knew. It could have been a total disaster. Everyone could have seized up and things could have gone wrong. And at 7.15, he said, how are you feeling, Bill? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't ask me. I don't know. I might seize up. I don't know. It's the most awful feeling. It's, it's like waiting for... Yeah. I don't know, uh, an execution or something. But anyway, it went well. It went smoothly. I'm pleased I was in it and did it, but please, never again. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> well, taking you back to those days, you know, when, when I think it was just two episodes a week. Yes. When it began. And, of course, it wasn't called Coronation Street. It was Florizel Street. Oh, no, Street. before it started, the title was Florizel Street, yes, which sounded like a sanitary detergent. And people called it Florizel and everybody groaned. And literally, just literally day, a couple of days before the first transmission, the executive producer, the producer and the director of the first episode were up all night thinking of a name. And the story goes that the executive producer at about two in the morning said, I'm going to bed, I'll leave you two at it. And in the morning he came into them, he said, right, I'll take any name you want so long as it's Coronation Street. Um, <laughs> and that was it. That, that's how it got its name. How did you land the part? I'd, done, uh, I'd been at Oldham Rep, uh, which was nearby Manchester. And in those days they were doing one or two series, one called Night Errand and one called Skyport. And I had long hair, mainly because I couldn't afford to get it cut in those days. And it was unusual. And they call, if they wanted an art student or something like that, they'd go get that bloke, roach bloke from Oldham Rep. So I did one or two literally uh, small parts, little cameos, a couple of pages, no more than that. Um... So they knew me for that. Then I went to London and did some films and I had a lead in a, in a play. And then I got this call. My agent said, uh, Granada are doing a new series. He said, I think it's a comedy like Norman Evans in Over the Garden Wall. Um, and they'd like you to go and read for it. And I said, well, I don't want to. I'd gone to London, got my flat, got established down there. But he said, you might as well go up. There's nothing else. And so I went up and I read for it. And it was for a young student. So obviously they would have thought of me because of having done bits before. And then later they, they offered me the part of this university student. And uh, my agent said, look, it's only going to run for 13 weeks. You might as well do it. You've got this play going out. You, you're well established. What a wonderful shot window. 13 weeks of twice weekly television and then this. So it's been a very long 13 <laughs> weeks, hasn't it? 42 it's, years. It certainly has. Yeah. Well, your character, Ken, stood out at the very beginning because he thought that he was a cut above mm. the other characters in the street. And there was this marvellous uh, bit, the famous scene, really, in that first episode in which you told your father that it was quite common to have a sauce bottle on the table. Oh, uh, well done, Geraldine. Yes, absolutely right. He had the sauce bottle. Uh, or oh, the milk bottle, was it, on the table as well? I can't remember. But, but yes, common. and he said, you're a right little snob, Ken Barley. And, and, uh, and he wanted to take his girlfriend to the Imperial Hotel where his mother was a cleaner. <laughs> his father <laughs> objected to that. But he wasn't really a snob. He's the only one from the street who went to university and got a degree. Nowadays, it's easier for people to do that. In those days, it was fairly rare. So I, he didn't see himself as a snob. He just wanted to get on in life and um, and improve himself a bit. So the problem with Ken has always been being an intellectual, having a university degree, why did he stay? So he had this awful weakness of relationships. I mean, he's killed off his family. I call him a one-man Greek tragedy. <laughs> mother run over by a bus and one wife committed suicide and so on. And so he had this thing where he's had all these 23 girlfriends and three wives. It doesn't mean he's a Romeo. It just means he's rather pathetic and can't hold on to anybody. So he has this weakness of relationships. Well, um, perhaps the biggest storyline, of course, of all time, regards soap, has been this Ken Deirdre, yes. Mike Baldwin sort of love triangle. 
And um, it was also the first big soap storyline that the newspapers really got mm. the attention of the press. Absolutely right. Uh, prior to that, you see, we, we, we were a drama serial. People forget this. We were, we were in the time of look back in anger, method acting, and we were state of the art, really, when we started. Then suddenly all these soaps came along and others joined us. And it was the Ken Deirdre, uh, uh, Mike Triangle that the papers suddenly realized we were actually front they showed the front page of a paper on the news and it was flashed up on the Manchester United football ground mm -hmm. Kent State's a dearie. they realized that majority of their readers were interested in in the soaps and it started that interest and from then on every tabloid employed somebody especially to get gossip and news about soap so we're responsible for all that really that that, um, that football match that yeah. that was between man united and arsenal and and I believe that uh, during the middle of it, they, they, as you say, flashed, flashed up the news up at time, yeah. that she had decided, you know, to stay Ken, with Ken. Deirdre stay stays with, with Ken. And, 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 great, whoa, and whoa, apparently whoa. got a bigger cheer yeah. than when uh, United scored the winning goal. Oh, I didn't know that. That's news to me. <laughs> but that, <laughs> well, it, it did get a big cheer. You see, everybody, they realize you've only got to mention something to do with the street and everybody uh, knows about it. it. It was quite extraordinary. But isn't it funny that today it's just uh, front page fodder, really? Yeah, I'm afraid uh, now, like everything else, uh, things have got uh, rather trivialized and, and there's so many so-called soaps. But for years, we fought not to be a soap. Uh, and we weren't originally, but I'm afraid now we're, we're in the, the general melee and have to accept that. Well, what about relationships now with the writers and the producers? I mean, being the senior member of the cast, what clout do you have when it comes to Ken's storylines? None. <laughs> you see, they, there's 14 writers, and uh, they fight very jealously for the stories that they put forward. And I gather that sometimes the storyline conferences are more dramatic than what you see on screen, people getting up and walking outside. So for us to try and have an input um, it wouldn't be good. Um, they write and we act. However, if you feel your character is going down a cul-de-sac and not working, you can go and talk to the producer, which I did just before the Ken Mike Deirdre. This is what was happening. Ken had been the young Jew, and I suppose he was moving into an elderly bracket, well, not el an older bracket, and wasn't being properly used. So I, I went to the producer and said, look, they're not writing anything for Ken. It's demoralizing. I'm lacking in confidence playing it. And they brought the Ken Mike Deirdre situation out of that. So you can have a, an input in that sense. The integrity of the character. Really. Yes, you believe... I, I, I mean, I like Ken. Ken is a very well-meaning, good guy. I mean, he's not terribly exciting. I, I wish he'd get up. I, I love comedy, actually. I'm a great giggler, too. I, I wish he'd have more comedy, but that's not what he is. I've got a great story coming out, which no doubt you're going to get on to. I don't know if we should talk a about a it, really. Aidan Critchley. Aidan Critchley. You thump him, I believe. Uh, oh, how dare you want to <laughs> say that? But yes, absolutely right. You said it, not me. Um, <laughs> yes, that is a story that's coming up. Yeah. And, um, and, of course, Deirdre's your third wife now? Uh, Deirdre's my third wife. Uh, well, she's not my wife. No. No, we're actually not married. Blanche keeps every so often saying that. We're back together. You know, it's funny that uh, Ken and Deirdre have split up, had row. She slammed that door in my face more times than I care to remember. And yet I was talking to one of the writers once. I said at, at the time, the, I said, there's hardly anybody married in the street. And he said, well, look, look at these pairs. He went on and said, there's Ken and Deirdre. I said, we're not married. He said, no, but as far as we're concerned, you're a pair. Even when we were separated, we were having rows. Or if she was off with someone, Ken was still having a go at them and things like that. So we've always been regarded as a pair because Anne and myself work very well together. We can do great row scenes. We can take them up, take them down. And she's rock solid on her words like when I bashed her against the door and she's crying still keeps going um, we've had some really good scenes well you're consummate actors of course both of you well that's very kind of you we, we enjoy what we do it's like when you get a strong so in fact it was during that period when I was shouting and screaming at Anne and I say bashing her against the door that I said in an interview I haven't enjoyed myself so much since my first wife died and it's absolutely true because as an actor you like the strength of the drama you like a, a positive story and, and those were. Well, I'm sure for our older listeners particularly, I have to say I include myself here, uh, what was it like working, you know, in those early days, William, with legends like Pat Phoenix, Violet Carson and, and Doris Speed? As a young actor, did you actually learn from them? 
Well, <laughs> yes, things are very different. And you know, I came as a young actor then, and, and Vi Carson was a very grand dame, and she really was. She, she was a wonderful person. But she had this face that you could break rocks on. And it really was a fabulous face. Um, she could go up to uh, Cecil Bernstein, managing director of Granada, if things were wrong, and, and talk to him and say, well, I'm not doing this, and, or whatever. And uh, threaten and, him with a handbag. Uh, well, yes, yeah, she could, really. But, but she was a very sweet person. But uh, you, you did have great respect for her. Mm -hmm. uh, things very different nowadays. Um, they were legends, though. They were legends, and they were character actors. Well, they, 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 they're all characters in the street, yes, and um, they became legends. Vi Carson was known very from Wilfred Pickles and, and mm -hmm. things before. I mean, she used to sit, again, with this great face, playing the piano, and this beautiful voice would, would come out. She's a very talented person. And nearly everybody in the street, well, everybody in the street in those days was an actor. They were, they were had come up through the, uh, usually theatre, and, and that the repertory that, days. The, the, you see, this is the sad thing about actors nowadays. Every major town in England used to have a repertory company, so there was a lot of work for actors, a good training ground. You haven't got that now, and it's much harder for them. But yes, in those days, it, it was different. We did two a week. We had a lot of rehearsal, and um, it was very tight ship and very good. Now we do four to five a week. We have no rehearsal. You have to be word perfect, and there's no prompting. You literally just go in and do it. Well, does this increase, you know, the number of programs per week affect the quality of the finished product, though? Well, I inevitably, uh, you know, sometimes you do a scene and you know that it should have been shaped and it should have had highs and lows that weren't there. You don't have the time for that. But um, basically, it seems to work pretty well. Um, sometimes you used to find at the first reading, it hits something really good. And then you spend the rest of the time at rehearsal trying to get back at that. Sometimes you hit things really well. But you don't have the time to polish and, and shape up. Even now, though, famous names are brought in. I mean, usually to play, actually, the comedy char characters. Roy Hudd, I mean, he appears regularly as the funeral, funeral director, uh, Archie Shuttleworth. Mm. And Maureen Lipman recently made a short uh, guest appearance as the landlady Lillian Spencer. How much do you enjoy, you know, working with these people who are real actors and actresses, of course, and mm. what do they bring to the oh, street? Oh, absolutely wonderful. I mean, Maureen Lipman was a delight and very refreshing, true professional and brilliant at her job. Very sweet person. And Roy Hudd is just a delight. He, He's just like he is, uh, always getting a laugh, but in, in a very nice and gentle way. He's a really, really nice man. In fact, we had a scene once where Ken and Deirdre came home um, into the hall, and they heard in the front room noises that sounded like Archie and Blanche were doing something they shouldn't be doing. We were looking absolutely aghast. And then eventually we opened the door, and they were, he was talking about getting his leg over and things like that, and the, he was teaching a ballroom dancing. <laughs> so uh, the shot was Ken and Deirdre looking in the door and a look of relief... And, and smiling. But of course, when we did that, all we were actually seeing was a camera. So we came to do that shot. The director said, okay, you just open the door, look in, look to the left of camera where they would be and look at, do a look of relief. And you're actually doing it to nobody. But when we did it, Roy Hudd was there and he dropped his trousers and he helped us tremendously with the expression we had to give. But that's Roy. He, he's, a, he's a lovely man. Lovely man. Now, of course, it is commercial and uh, ratings-driven serial drama. So when the producers tried to jazz up the street, you know, and run uh, perhaps modern sensational storylines like teenage pregnancy, mm -hmm. drug addiction and religious cults, um, do, do you find that a bit sort of tiresome to have to take on? It, it's, a very, it's a very difficult problem for them because um, the thing about Coronation Street is that it, it, it is slightly out of date. It, it is a slightly feminine, slightly camp Lancashire backwater, and it is meant to be. We're not meant to have the upfront big stories of EastEnders. On the other hand, though, if you don't have some, people say you're really out of date and you're out of touch, so they've got to strike that balance. In 1997, Brian Park took over control of, of the street from a producer's um, angle, and, and he actually was nicknamed the Axeman because mm. he controversially sacked several very popular characters and introduced these newer, hard-hitting racier storylines. Mm. Were, were you ever sort of fearful of your situation? Well, <coughs> it was very worrying. Uh, uh, Brian Park came and, and for two months I, I didn't speak to him or hear anything about him but these people were disappearing and, and he said he had a couch put outside his office for people to sit on before they got the act. I mean if you were summoned upstairs it was really worrying. Um, as I said for two to three months um, I hardly spoke to Brian at all and then I got a message from his secretary saying Brian would like to have lunch with you. I thought oh crikey here we 
go, you know. So we arranged this lunch, and um, here I am. We chatted away, and I chatted away uh, about uh, how difficult it was for him and things like that. And we drank some champagne, and then he, he went to leave at the end of an hour and a half, and he just said to me, well, welcome aboard, bro. And it was four o'clock in the morning. I sat bolt upright. I thought, what does he mean? I've been here for sort of 38 years. And he's suddenly saying, well, and I realized that he was just checking through everybody. But Brian knew what he was doing. He was a program maker. And, and uh, by and large, the street thrived under him. And he did rejuvenate. Pruning is good up to a point, like a tree. Overdo it, it dies. Don't do it enough, and, and it uh, weakens it. And I, I think he, he got it right. Well, now, your character, Ken, has really been involved in really, I suppose, all the dramatic and certainly important uh, comical storylines. Do you prefer the serious stuff or the comedy acting? <clears throat> I personally prefer the comedy, but they found that I'm quite good at the tragedy. Uh, Timing can, is very important in comedy, of course. Timing is, is essential in comedy. It, it is absolutely crucial. Um, and in the drama, you've got to know how to hold it and, and hit it right. But because I had these heavy stories, and I can cry, actually. I, you know, not a, lot, a lot of actors can't cry. They sort of pull faces and make a noise. But I can actually cry. How do you do that? Do you think of a, your, your pet dog or something? Yeah, yeah, you can think about something like that. But I, I can actually do it, just like I can giggle. And um, I've done that a few times. I've wept, and, and, uh, and, and I can shout and scream and keep going quite effectively. So they, they tend to think that's best for can and also being a, a teacher of responsibility I think they feel uh, they can't make him too frivolous uh, or too ridiculous which is a shame because I, I do get the odd bits of comedy and I really enjoy it but I can enjoy a good I, I like a strong story I don't care which yeah. way it goes it gives you a chance to yeah show to get your, hold of it to get hold of it and show your talent mm. now of course, there's a price to fame. I mean, you obviously lead a very comfortable life. You live in Wimslow. I think that's well known to people, uh, which is a very nice part of the world. Um, but there's a price for fame. I mean, you can't go into a restaurant. You can't go abroad on holidays. In fact, there's a lovely story about the Orkneys. Oh, yeah. Yes, I, I, that's true. I mean, you just Case know. Case in point. I went up to a friend of mine who was a teacher and was working up in the Orkneys, and I just went to visit him. And literally within five minutes, the whole village knew I was there, and they all turned out. It's very nice, that. It's very sweet. Normally, it makes people happy, particularly some of the elderly who live on their own, who treat us like family and write me letters like, get your hair cut and get some weight off. But it's well-meaning and, and, and caring. Yes, you can't... Uh, housebreaking wouldn't be an option as a job. Um, <laughs> <coughs> you, you're, you're known wherever you go. But I, I've well, in, fact, in fact, actually, you might get away with it. We've um, <laughs> got to be a lookalike. Oh, actually, I did. One day I, I opened a, a, a motion master cinema in, in somewhere in England, and they had a whole lot of lookalikes, and I was the only one who wasn't. And standing amongst them was the only time I felt peculiar, and I realized everybody looking would think, I was a lookalike. Other than that, I know who I am. I don't have any problems with it. And overall, the, the pros outweigh the cons of being recognized. And it's useful, like, for instance, being able to go to the uh, Christian Spiritualist Church and talk. Um, being known helps me to get a message over, and you can help charitable events and things like that. So overall, it's fine. You've got two children who are <coughs> sort of one past their teenage thing. She, she's at St. Andrew's University. Uh, my daughter, Verity, is at St. Andrew's University. And Sec a, younger, a younger son. And a younger son, William, is at Shrewsbury School. My elder son, Linus, is in films. He's playing Bobby Kennedy in a film over in Canada at the moment. Didn't he play your son in the... In, in yeah, when, he, in, when he was nine, he did, yes. Uh, just for a short time, he played my son in the street. A young William, who's at Shrewsbury, also wants to go into acting. He's just 16 just starting his A-level, so we'll and see. You, you're not going to put him off? He knows. I've told him he knows what it's like. He's done Shrewsbury's a very good school for drama, and he's doing a Shakespearean production at the moment, so he, he knows what it's like. Well, finally, how long... Oh, gosh, is it over already? It There's is virtually, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> the music's coming up any moment. Right. Finally, how long will Ken Barlow and yourself go on? Because one thing in life is certain, we cannot stay here forever. We cannot plan, of course, exactly when and where we shed this mortal coil. So ideally, would you wish to depart this world on the set of Coronation Street? 
uh, not physically actually on it, but still, uh, still that while I can stand and speak and enjoy it, I, I would wish to continue. I'm very fond of Coronation Street. I enjoy it, and I'm very proud to be in it. And, yeah, as long as they want me and I'm able to do it, I'm happy to do so. William Roach, MBE, thank you so much for joining me on the Geraldine Jameson interview this week.